All right, let's try this again, ladies and gentlemen. First time, no good. This time, we're back. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the F4L Headquarters Podcast. Oh, that's better. Goodness me, I'm telling you. Thank you, thank you, subtle. It's okay. It's all right, relax. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, folks. <coughs> so, goes to show you, second time's a charm. Anyway. All right, folks. Well, today's very special edition of the f Headquarters podcast is full of all kinds of randomness that normally would be. Today is Saturday, September 16th. We are on the eve of what's going to be our friend's wedding tomorrow. And as someone who has done this song and dance before, I wish them all the best, as I said. That's a quick quick shout-out to our friends Rena and Mike, and we wish them all the very best tomorrow. And we'll be there, of course, to witness them as they were there when we did it first. Um, we look forward to watching them do the exact same thing. Um, so it should be pretty epic. So, excellent. <laughs> Uh, oh. So, anywho, today. Today, folks, we have a lot of stuff to go, and the ants are all fired up. You know, I think what I'm going to do is, you know, I keep talking about my ant band because, you know, not everyone is lucky enough to have a very talented group of ants to can play music and can play in um, transitional music. So, um, you know, I think I might do a poll to have you guys maybe name our ant band. Um, the F4L Ant Band. I don't know. We'll figure that out later. But in the meantime, we have a lot to get over. So let's go to our first um, segment. Thank you guys very much so so much so there all right so our first thing here i'm going to do a full uh season two evaluation of well i should just say i should do a, i'm going to be doing a review of season two of heels um the heels of course on stars i got to find i got to watch it i watched an episode a week because that's how they released it and i actually appreciated that because um, one of the things that I've been trying to do with other platforms, whenever other people release a TV show or whatever, because what normally happens, things like Cobra Kai or Sweet Tooth or things like that, where they release the entire season, um, what I've been doing is only watching or limiting myself to one episode per week, so that way there I don't blow through the whole um, season in one day. And in case you're wondering, yes, I've done that before for those very shows. <laughs> um, and because of that, you know, I'll watch the first episode and then, you know, end up watching the entire thing. And then all of a sudden i got to wait almost a year for the next season. So I appreciated that, you know, their release schedule was pretty much, you know, weekly. And I appreciated that. But what I might do now is re-watch the entire uh, second season now that it's all out. Um to do so because it was that good to watch it again all right so for those people who don't know heels heels is a tv drama uh that is um circling around Stephen amell and alexander ludwig who are brothers who run a who co-run a independent wrestling company in a fictional place called duffy which is somewhere in the south probably right next to quahog and springfield and Tromaville, uh, you're going to find uh, Duffy right there. Um, and basically what they do is they're trying to keep their dad's wrestling business afloat. Stephen Amell is the eldest of the two, and he's kind of the guy that kind of wants to, is kind of the one holding the whole show together. He's writing the show. I mean, some people in the business have issues with that considering Technically speaking, in the independent world, we don't really use scripts on the independent circuit. Um, it's a little unnecessary 
generally speaking, on the independent circuit, um, a lot of guys will just kind of come and go. You'll get whoever shows up at your venue, and you'll kind of, you, even if you have an idea, you'll have a booker there who will tell you who's going to do what that night, and then that's kind of how that works. Um, there's really no one to write a script to this, this extent. The script thing you might see in something like a WWE or an AEW, something big like that where they have television that's going to be massive. For an independent wrestling company in Germany, you won't see a script per se. Uh, but I got to say, the acting is phenomenal in the show because these actors, the men, the women, everyone involved here puts their bodies like all of us did in real life, uh, on the line when they go into the on the set, um, you could see the the respect that the actors had for the business as they d- did the show. Um, Stephen Mel, who you guys might know as Green Arrow, by the way, I never watched Green Arrow, but I did watch this, and this is my first real exposure to Stephen Mel. Um, outside of the wrestling world, I know that he did a few matches with Cody Rhodes a.k.a. Stardust, and he's done some other things in the wrestling world. He is also a wrestling fan. But more so than a wrestling fan, he's also committed himself to training uh, to the wrestling world, and he did a fantastic job in this role as Jack Spade. Um, Alexander Ludwig, who plays his brother in the show, fantastic job by him as well. He's Ace Spade. He's the hot-tempered younger brother who is the sports prodigy who comes home to get involved in the wrestling business he was never allowed to be part of. Um, Of course, anyone who has a brother or siblings, you know there's going to be some type of rivalry, especially when you're dealing with brothers. I have two brothers and a sister, so I know how that goes Um, all too well. Uh, I'm the eldest of the four, so... (laughs) Uh, I also know what that's like to be on that end of things, and you are constantly the one who has to set the mode for everything else in the house, and the one who kind of steps up when no one else is able to do so. Anywho, um, so overall, this season we saw the return, uh, you know, this is their second season, so um, they're trying to, with this season, the, the premise, if you would, is they're trying to reestablish themselves the brothers are trying to reunite um there was some shenanigans in the last episode last season um are the brothers able to reconcile um you know how are they able to put their differences aside can they work together the acting in this this season is fantastic is much more crisp compared to the first season um one of the things i noticed is how it evolved at the fir- at the early stages Originally, how it started, you know, you know, in the first season was kind of touch and go, kind of get it, get all these characters kind of established. This season, we kind of should have an idea of who the basic players are, and what's really good is they kind of keep it to that narrative, so it's simple to kind of follow. They don't go too far outside the no, the the realm um, of you know thing. A lot of the times with these multiple person dramas, is there's so many people involved that it's hard to keep track of who you're supposed to watch, who is the, you know, the protagonist, who we're supposed to care about. And in this show, you do care about a lot of the characters, even the guys you're not supposed to like. Um, In this series, you know, you have the little small independent company that is called DWA or DWF. That's the Duffy Wrestling Federation. That's the one that Jack Spade and his brother run. That's the independent league. And then they're, of course, having to compete with the, quote, big guys who have television. um, And they are, um, you know, basically they're run by a guy named Gully. And you know what? He's great at being a heel, uh, being a a promoter and being a cutthroat guy, but also being kind of slimy. Um, (laughs) It's very believable, honestly. Uh, He comes across as nice sometimes and really cutthroat when he's not. Um, A lot of people have said that he reminds them of Vince McMahon. I disagree with that scenario. I do not think he's like Vince McMahon. Um, Vince McMahon um, 
who was, up until recently, the owner of WWE. If those people don't know, if you've lived under a rock, um, WWE and the UFC have now merged part of Endeavor. So there is no... Vince McMahon, for the first time, ever has a boss outside of... Well, second time, because his dad was his first boss. And now Endeavor is his bosses again. So that's kind of cool. Uh, or I guess. But anywho... Stick with the narrative, though. Um, Gully is, is is you know the big promoter of the big guys, and basically what this is about is the big company trying to swallow a little fish, that is the small independent wrestling league, and them trying to kind of gut for the good talent and so forth. So there's a lot of heart in the show. Um, they do dive a little bit into what happens after the wrestling flop, you know, a little bit into the kind of. What happens after that twilight is over? <laughs> when you decide to hang up the boots for real? Uh, they go over the dangers of wrestling. They go into the, the feeling. What, what's really good about the show is that it shows that, you know, there's more to life. and There's more to these wrestlers than what you see on television. There's more, these people are real people who have real lives, who have real families. And I think a lot of the times people take that for granted when it comes to pro wrestling. Or acting, for that matter, for anything like that. A lot of people don't take into account that these people who either you like or you love or hate or boo or cheer, these are real-life people who have real-life families. And the effects of what goes on and what they're exposed to is kind of a real thing. So, um, I enjoyed Season 2. I'm not going to do any spoilers because I think you guys should check it out. It's on Stars for those people who don't know. Um, you can watch it on Hulu if you have the right connections, so to speak. Um, or whatever the case may be. I do suggest you check out um, Heels on Stars, Even if you're not a wrestling fan, the acting alone is fantastic. It might give you a little bit more of an insight into what the world is kind of like. Because um, they do a pretty good job. And the physical, the physical nature of this show, I'm sure, was not easy on the actors and the actresses involved. And that's why I have a lot of respect for the people who put themselves through that. Because I put myself through that many, 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 many years. And I'm proud of those things. And we're going to get into that in segment two uh, a little bit more. But um, I do want to say that I do think you guys should check it out. And judging by how season two ended, I'm going to have to guess. I'm hoping that it will be a season three. Otherwise, what a way to <laughs> get way, way to end the show. Uh, I loved it. I, I thought it was great, and I actually kind of saw it coming. But I thought it was clever, and um, hopefully there is going to be a season three. I guess there's no confirmed word, but I guess with the strike and so forth, it's really hard to really plan anything, really, what's going to happen going forward, right? I'm going to guess. I, I think it would be a safe bet for anyone right now not to bank on anything going back until after the strike is over. If it gets over anytime soon. That's my personal opinion, but that's just me. Alright, so. That is my review of Heels on Stars, Or you can watch it on Hulu or anywhere you can access Stars. I think they have their own little app thing too you can check out. Uh, but go check it out. A lot of hardworking people worked on this show. I know some people who helped out with the um, planning of the show. And also helped out with um, oh, on-site who know a lot about the wrestling business, a really good friend of mine, um, helped work behind the scenes, and I know it was as you know accurate as possible. So I want to say they did a great job. They picked a great person to help them along the way, too. So um, that's going to be my review of Heels. And now stick around as we get ready for more. Ants. <laughs> everyone so uh so yes here we are ladies and gentlemen we're gonna do our i wanted to tell you guys a story so yesterday i had the opportunity to go check out um a wrestling company that was doing a wrestling show down downtown uh, it was called renegade wrestling alliance wrestling alliance yes rwa out of rhode island 
run by T. Phoenix. Now, I want to tell you why this is a special um, show venue ring for me. Um, for those people who don't know, I uh, lived under a rock. Next month will mark my wife and I's fifth year officially being married. And we, in fact, got married in a wrestling ring. And, in fact, it was that very wrestling ring we got married in five years ago. Um, of course, it wasn't in the middle of the town, <laughs> but it was um, in the venue and so forth. And T. Phoenix was there, and we are very grateful and thankful for allowing that to give my wife her the wedding she dreamed of. And it was a fantastic time, and of course, you know, fulfilling a dream of becoming one big family, and that's what we did. It was awesome. The way it should be. <laughs> so, all honesty, the ring alone is a little nostalgic for me. And those people who don't know, if you lived under a rock, I myself have been involved and in around the route, the pro wrestling business since I was, let's see... <clears throat> well, I've always wanted to be in the pro wrestling business since I was very young. Um, I was compete. I started martial art tournaments, as you guys, as I talked about. We'll talk about that in segment three. But and I don't want to get too far ahead. But you know, one of my dreams after seeing wrestling live was to feel that same feeling those guys must have felt. To feel the energy of that crowd. That's something that you can't prepare for unless you've actually feel, felt it. The adrenaline you feel <clears throat> stepping onto into a ring and to be, to be able to hold a crowd's attention and to be able to kind of mold that crowd around you and to tell a story in the ring with actions and, and a lot of it is truly a work of art and a masterpiece and only few can actually do it well. Um... People try, but there are some who do it better than others, obviously. Um, but, you know, since a very young age, I was, I think at my first wrestling show live, I was seven. And I remember, what I remember the most, it wasn't the main event of the show that made me want to become a pro wrestler. It was the opening match. The main event, because of course you always remember these things. You remember when we get, quote, bit by the bug which is wanting to get into the business. And the main event of the show was Hulk Hogan defending the title against the big boss man, Whoopi. But the opening match, that's what made me want to become a pro wrestler. That's what made me want to get into the business and feel what these guys must have felt. The opening contest was... it comes So, so anyone who's a wrestling fan might know some of these guys. Well... These two guys. Steve Lombardi, quote, yes, Steve Lombardi versus Leaping Laney Poffo. And at that point, he was doing the Frisbee poem gimmick, the, uh, fris the poems on a Frisbee gimmick. Uh, Leaping Laney Poffo, who you might not know, is the real, was the real-life brother of the Macho Man Randy Savage, who was a pretty big name in WWE. Leaping Laney Poffo was his younger brother. And, of course, he would become the genius, one of the most despised, you know, managers, if you would. But also one talented writer in general. His poetry was legit. Um, and he, you know, he came from a lineage of wrestling people, did Lenny Poffo. And Steve Lombardi, you might not know that name off the top of your head, but you might know his other persona as the Brooklyn Brawler. And then it pretty much, whatever they needed, something else. Because he was, he would become a stagehand for them or a, a background agent for them for years. And last I knew, he was still there. Um, he was, you know, he was the Brooklyn Brawler. He was Kimchi for a few times. He was a Doink once. Pretty much, he was a kind of the workhorse of the guys who lost on Saturday morning. You needed that guy. They call those guys exhibition talents. Well, that's a technical term for them. My uncle called them no, but no names is what my uncle called them. <laughs> but um, all honesty, that's what captivated me. I wanted to be able to be those guys to captivate that audience to get the crowd to cheer or boo or whatever. So uh, that became something I said I was going to do to my uncle that day when I was seven. Um, 
And when I got my opportunity when I was 18, I was already doing multiple sports in high school, including real wrestling, on top of everything else I was doing. I, I like to stay busy. Um, at 18, I walked into the Killer Kowalski School of Wrestling and started training as a pro wrestler six months before I graduated high school. And no, in case you're wondering, well, does that mean you dropped out of your high school? No, 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 no. See, I was an honor student, oddly enough. Um, in all honesty, I my goal was to graduate high school. And what people don't might might not know is I was going from myself to high school. I was emancipated at that point. So that meant that I was in charge of me getting to and from school. I was also in charge of me getting to wrestling training after I got done with school. And of course, I still played high school sports as well. Uh, my three sports were soccer in the fall, wrestling in the winter, and swimming in the f spring. Those are my three sports. And of course, if you know anything about those sports, you know you have to stay in pretty good shape. And I always was. And I was always, I took very good care of myself as far as the gym goes, because I always felt that I needed to be. Um, I was really, really skinny growing up. I was short, skinny, and <laughs> it was kind of gross. You could see my ribs, but, you know, get me on a mat, you know, the kid across from me was, their eyes are bugging out of their head because they knew they were going to be in for a fight. But, you know, still, I was sk still scrawny and small. So I went to the gym after going talk to my doctor at 13. I started hit, you know, lifting weights and stuff like that and getting healthy and putting on muscle somewhat and... Then I ended up just getting into sports and stayed in shape. And really, I'd stay that way until I was, you know, until I got my injury in 2003. So there you go. But anyway, long story short, pro wrestling has been part of my life. And when I went there the other night to see the, these guys in the RWA, I see a hungry group of talented guys there. I see a lot of guys who are... You know, maybe they're not known like the Hulk Hogan's of today or any of the other people on television. But you know what? These guys have a chance, and they are some of the hardest working young, uh, hardest working people, men, women, everyone together. One of the things that I always loved about the pro wrestling world, once I got involved in it, is the brotherhood of it. There's nothing like it. Um, you you know, the going to an arena and shaking everyone's hand before and after. Um, this is an act that I still do to this day when I am, you know, working or when I'm doing stuff. Um, I always take a point to do that. Uh, and it's a sign of respect. It's also a sign of loyalty and a sign of brotherhood, camaraderie. And it makes the locker room healthy. And actually that was started, that was tradition started by Kowalski and that a lot of people would utilize. And that's actually what brought it to the mainstream. And now it's practiced pretty much everywhere, including the WWE, AEW, all these places now do this practice. May not have been a thing they always have done. But it's definitely now practice in any locker room I've been in the last <laughs> 20 years, maybe. So, again, I started training. And then when I graduated high school with honors, I guess I graduated high school with honors, I um, went full-time to wrestling school and got and completed my training and got signed to my first contract, <laughs> which was a lot of fun and a lot of interesting learning experience because I was 19 years old, folks. 19 years old walking into an adult locker room, um, <laughs> and it was quite an interesting thing. Um, and if anyone knows about my, you know that journey, but anyway... I want to talk about this RWA, or Renegade Wrestling Alliance is what they're called, run by T. Phoenix. What a great job. Um, he knows how to get people over. He knows how to get this talent. He knows how to believe in his group. I saw that last night. I saw everyone working together. I love that. I love the when everyone comes together and everyone's willing to pitch in. That's a great thing. Um, you know, I retired from in-ring competition when, in 2019. I thought, you know, my body doesn't like it anymore. Maybe it's time for me to hang it up. But what happens is, and I was talking to someone about this very thing last night, is you never really want to retire. And even if you do retire, there's no official retirement. Um, 
because you always get that calling, that burn, or you get bit, as we call it, the bug, if you would, to get back into the business. And all it takes is that moment. All it takes is that one feeling to get in there. And when I look at this talented roster, some of these people, again, you might not have heard of some of these guys, but let me tell you a little bit about some of the people I saw last night. Um, I already talked about how, you know, T Phoenix does a great job, just the anchor of this company. AJP, AJP, um, the entitled one, I guess they call him. Um, he is uh, the son of uh, T Phoenix, but he is a phenomenal worker. Let me tell you what, what I like about AJP. Um, AJP busts his butt in the ring. And I mean, he busts it. He works hard in the ring. I remember I saw him work a long time ago. I think he was uh, he was a lot younger then, <laughs> but I think he was just starting out. But he was in the ring when it was just a bare ring, taking that time to do to work through matches and work the the ring psychology. That is a sign of someone who gets the wrestling business. And that's when you know you have a prodigy. Someone who's willing to put that extra work in. AJP is that person I saw take as much time as he could in that ring to get as much work out in. And I'm not just talking running ropes. Anybody can run ropes. That's honestly something everybody should do when you go to any show. But what he does is extra stuff working. And then, not only does he do that, but he also helps the other guys around who might need a little help. You know, a tip here and there. That is a fantastic, you know, camaraderie there. Other people they have there is Sean Leader, who you maybe don't know who Sean Leader is, but I, I think Sean Leader might be one of the best little men in the business. He is a very agile individual. He's also a very real life person, um, a very cool, down to earth individual who also busts his ass in the ring. Part of my language. Uh, the other, his tag team partner last night was another one. I didn't even know he was going to be there. Was Dick Lane, um, formerly known as the Insane Dick Lane. And I, you know, one of these days when it comes to this show, I mean, one of our last things here today we're going to do is, you know, people would like to have him come on the show. I personally would love to have Dick Lane on this show. Um, a lot of these guys I'd love to have on the show, but Dick Lane specifically, um, I feel like he has had his gimmick stolen by someone who is doing it on television right now. And I would like to talk to him about that and how he how he feels about that. Because Dick Lane, the same Dick Lane, was is a fantastic person who thinks outside the box. I know, I know people look at him and can laugh at it. Again, he's a cool, down-to-earth dude who works his butt off in the ring. He's also a family guy, and I respect that because I am also a family man. Um, he's a newer father, so I get how that is. And I wanted to make sure he was good with all that. Um, and like me, he said he was retired too. And I guess that didn't last long because he usually doesn't. But, you know, him and Sean Leader last night looked fantastic. Also, another one I want to tell you guys about is Eddie Sherman. Eddie Sherman might be one of the best big men in the business right now. He's got it down. He's got the big man gimmick down. Um, I, I dig the gimmick. It's a very adult gimmick. I've seen him wrestle a few times, and he is he's spot on. He's someone I could probably do a program with. He'd be something. Um, he is very he's very very charismatic. I like that uh, for a guy his size. He can move around the ring. He knows the psychology. He knows to work the crowd. Um, you know, Eddie Sherman might be one of the best big men in the business right now on the independent circuit. Uh, another guy was Crimson Alcamora. Another fantastic worker. He's a workhorse, this guy. All these guys are workhorses for this company. They all bust their butts in the ring. They work together as a team, putting to the ring together, helping each other train, helping each other work through, through um, you know, spots. It was great to watch. Um, it was an honor to, um, you know, witness it all. But also I got bit at the same time. <laughs> And I'm thinking, yo, maybe it is time for return in 2024. And it would depend on, I think for me it would depend on who and which one was going to return in 2024. I think if 
Jazz Fitness was going to return in 2024. I think that I could see. In all honesty, and I'm going to ask people, do you think that two th- Jazz Fitness, for those people who don't know, was the heel character I was. And the, the reason why Jazz Fitness was created is because when I came back to pro wrestling after my injury, after I graduated with two college degrees, I decided, you know, I wanted to get back in the wrestling world, and I was a little bit bigger, but I still had the athleticism. I still knew how to work the ring. I still knew how to work a microphone, which is ultimately what I am the best at. Again, I I owe that training to, you know, my trainers, uh, Kowalski and Slick Wagner Brown and all those guys who took that time to help me become the talker I am today. But, um... You know, honesty, I, I think it might be time in 2024. Maybe it's time to re- rehash. Maybe it's time to open up the fitness center again. Maybe I need to, uh, you know, leave LA Fitness California for a little while. I don't know. We'll have to see. But, um, and if that was the case, what, where, where would I, I would think that I would have to work the ring rust off. Um, I haven't been inside a ring other than doing some spots here and there and doing some trainings and. I do some seminars here and there, which is nice. But when I'm doing seminars for people, it's more for the promo stuff. I'm not taking bumps or anything. Um, I should. (laughs) But, you know, and I still can. I still know how to do all... It's kind of like riding a bike. Once you've done it, you know how to do it. You're not going to kill yourself doing it as long as you know what you're doing. Um, And I honestly think it might be time in 2024. Maybe... In all honesty, I was thinking of Goldberg last night, of all people, Bill Goldberg. And what I what I mean by that is, really, my kids were so young when I was doing stuff that they never really got to see me, you know, perform at any level. But, you know, I think, you know, my kids are also older now, but I think it would be nice or special for them to see me do what kind of put me on the map. So I'm thinking maybe in 2024, maybe I might have one more run left in me. What do you guys think? <laughs> Hit me up and let me know if you think I should return to pro wrestling. Is Jazz is is the world ready for Jazz Fitness's return, or is it time for Jazz Vengeance to return? Let me know. All right. Um, so that was my thing, and I'm, all honesty, I might have to you know reach out to T Phoenix and Renegade uh, Wrestling because I think I would love for the opportunity just to. Um, put these guys over. I think they're doing a fantastic job over there, and I, I I, have a knack for talent, and I have a knack for knowing who's good, and I know all those things. And, uh, yeah. And they got some really, a lot of talent there. Alright. That being said, that concludes that segment. Moving on to the next one. Ants? <laughs> much appreciate it appreciate it thank you guys hardest working ant band in the planet right here and i don't know anybody else who could say that they have an ant band but ladies and gentlemen my ant band all right so next here we go well that but this is more this i guess we're gonna have to get a ufc sound here somewhere Anywho, well, quick quick update before I go into f- the future of UFC, in my opinion. Um, and those people who don't know, and I mentioned last week, uh, my son and I officially started our bowling league last Monday. Uh, we'll be returning this Monday as well. <laughs> so it's what you do when you join a league. It's a consistent thing. Um, and as I expected, it was an adjustment as I'm doing a different type of bowling that I'm used to. But we're getting there. I think we're coming along pretty good. I think I have a good feeling about it. So I'll keep you guys informed about that later. Anywho, folks, we have two little bit of segments here. I mean, this actually, I guess, counts as, sh- as shout-outs, I guess, too. But um, So as I mentioned before, I grew up, um, you know, my grandmother got me involved with martial arts. I had a lot of energy, and I also lived in a really, really tough area. 
So she thought it would be a best idea for me to join in martial arts. I was fortunate enough to have a dojo that, you know, had what they called cross-trained people. Cross-trained meant, back then, it meant that you were, you, you know, trained and you mixed up your different styles. So in other words, for me, I learned judo, Muay, I learned judo, Muay Thai, Kenpo, Kenpo, judo, Muay Thai, Chun Kudu, as well as, um, hold on, i got to remember them all. <laughs> judo, Kenpo, judo, Muay Thai, Chun Kudu, boxing, and of course, amateur and professional wrestling were a different story, but the other things were all done primarily in that gym. And I would compete, and our school would compete with other you know, schools in our region. That's how we did it back then. You competed against other dojos, other schools, other clinics, whatever you guys call them now, centers. And we would compete against other up and down the East Coast. My family, of course, weren't into this whole thing at all, so it was mostly it was me traveling with my dojo, and I'm very loyal to my dojo, and I think um, one of the things about me is always my loyalty to every, you know, to whatever I put my heart into, which, you know, which I think is important. But one of the things that set me aside was I, decide, I, I found out that I have a knack for learning human chess, in all honesty, that's my favorite part about competing. A lot of people would ask me, what's your favorite part of you know fighting? What do you like about fighting? In all honesty, it was the human chess part of it. Having to figure out how to beat someone, um, what to, how far it should go, kind of what they're going to try to do, and then how to counter that, and how to end the match, and, and what point. Um, and I talked about this before. I had tournaments almost every single weekend, uh, sometimes a few. And I fought, f- and I don't suggest this and do not do this. I fought hurt a lot of the times because I wouldn't tell my coach or anyone else that I was hurt. Because again, I'm loyal to my school. Please do not do this, by the way. I can't emphasize that enough. If you are injured and you are hurt, please, please, please listen to your doctors. Do not rush your return too quick. It will haunt you. Trust me, you know, older, like me. Thank you very much. Here's a quick PSA for you guys. And trust me, I know a lot about them. But one of the things that, you know, set me aside is what I would do separate than a lot of other people. Whenever you go to these events, there's, you know, things going on at these events, multiple matches going on. Sometimes what would happen is a person would have their match and in their tournaments, you would have three or four, you know, things that day if you, you know, moved on. And um, a lot of the other kids who were in our dojo, I mean, there was really only four of us really that competed on, on that level. And actually, one of them took over the dojo after our sensei passed out and passed away. And, you know, I've been, I helped them out once in a while. And as I mentioned before, we did find some of the old some of those old tournaments on footage. I'm going to try to find... They're trying right now to kind of convert them onto some type of digital platform so that maybe I can show some of my younger days of me (laughs) when I competed because that's quite a trip for me. Uh, We do watch them currently because, you know, it's an older school. So we do watch... We watch some of the old VHS tapes. That's what they were on um, of the... um, old tournaments and stuff like that. It's, it's, a, it's a trip back to memory lane. But one of the things that I took serious is competing and being able to kind of figure people out, the human chess capacity. I would do homework on people. Um, this was before social media. No one posted anything. Because, again, back in the 80s, you didn't even tell people you did martial arts. Because if you did, you were picked on and you, were, you had a rough time at school. It wasn't respected. It wasn't a sign of anything else. You, you, it was kind of, you know, you were you were treated kind of poorly for doing martial arts back then. Uh, now it's a little bit more socially acceptable, which I think is awesome. I'm glad that it is like that now. It's changed a lot, actually, now that I think about it. But one of the things that doesn't change is when you get to be at that level, and I still have this, is the ability to be able to read another fighter, to be able to kind of pinpoint people and kind of see who the 
you know, separate the weak from the you know strong kind of a thing. Now, some of the other kids on my team, again, there were only only four of us who competed, who traveled, and some of, only like one of them, actually, it's the one who took over the dojo, would ask me, you know, what do you think about this? Because again, back then, you competed against your belt level or your rank level back then, and again, it was freestyle tournaments. So basically, what that meant was you would compete against other dojos that were also what they called cross trains. Again. Kenpo, Judo, Muay Thai, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I had some of those accolades and so forth, and I did do those things, so I competed in a lot of those. And the person who took over the dojo is the only one who really, you know, would ask me for, you know, tips here and there. Uh, but for the most part, I still am able to kind of pinpoint who the ones to kind of keep an eye out for. I still have this. I still... And how I judge that is, in order to become the best, to become seen as a champion, to be someone that you want that respect, you need to take on the best, honestly. You need to be able to beat the best. Um, There's an old saying in wrestling that you could have probably assigned to anything. To be the man, you you must beat the man. Um... And ultimately, that's you know that's an old saying by one of the legends in pro wrestling. But you can adapt that to any sport. To be the man, you must beat the man. In all honesty, if you want to make an impact, you want to beat the toughest guy. You don't want to beat the same person you fought seven times over. You want to fight someone smaller than you because that doesn't make you look any tougher. If you're someone that needs feels the need to cut weight in order to beat someone then you're in the wrong sport because eventually that's only going to last that's not going to last you too long that strategy but what I did is I comp- I compiled a little bit of a list of people who I believe you will be seeing or you could see ultimately as future UFC champions if they chose to be these are people some of these people you have probably you know if you watch our shows, you might hear some of these names, because I can tell you that some of them are on here. Some of these guys are not on our show. But that doesn't mean that I don't pay attention to people. It doesn't mean that I don't know who the ones to keep an eye out for are. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share this list with you guys. There's 14 kind of, um, well, tech. we'll see what I mean. 14 different uh, people who I can see as being future UFC champions because they are that good. The measuring sticks, if you would. People to keep an eye out for because these are the people, these 14-ish people will be the ones you got to keep an eye out for because these people will be the ones to run UFC one day. So that without that being, without further ado, let's start at the first. There's really no rankings. It's not about the rankings. It's about kind of where these people, the people I kind of wrote down the list of. And I, I can also tell you that the way I came across this list is these are the people who also follow me and people who value uh, the fact that I, they recognize the fact that I recognize them. So that being said, that is why, that's another reason why these people are on this list. Here we go. Number one, the Adele Boys. I know I said 14 lists, but technically speaking, you could take Anthony, Mason, Ty, or even Troy, and I would predict any one of them could be UFC champions at any given point. Um, They are the epitome of, they are, you know, Florida. They are the, in my opinion, they are one of the toughest groups the toughest, hard, technically sound fighters out there currently on the rising star market. And in my opinion, if you're in the U.S. and you want to make a name and you want to be, you know, you want that kind of, I want to be the best. If you can say you can beat an Odell boy, that would actually, to me, that would raise some eyebrows. And actually, there's someone on this list who has beat, a couple people on this list, who have even taken the adults to the mat to the limit or have defeated them um, I think they're technically one of the best, most sports athletic young men out there because it doesn't matter what sport it is wrestling, martial arts, football baseball, motocross 
the Adele boys are tough. And if you can beat them, then I would say that you have a good chance of becoming whatever you want. And I think all four of them, that's Anthony, Mason, Ty, or Troy even. Troy is the youngest. On our show, we have all four of them on our show, and they are a nightmare. We'll see what happens when the Team Warfare event happens, because that's going to be something. That's in November, by the way, that tournament. And they are already four people, so <laughs> that's going to be something. But um, that's number one. Number two, again, it's a shared kind of thing, and that's going to be Henry and Jairo Menya, the Menya boys. Henry El Nero Menya and his brother Jairo, the Pitbull Menya, also have been guests on this show, are two of the hardest working young men out of Texas. And what I love about the fact that, what I like about them also is the fact that they keep adding tools to their arsenal. That is a smart fighter. And now, a lot of these people are trained in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which is awesome. Some of them are in judo, some of them in whatever, kickboxing, Muay Thai. But when it comes to the, the Menya boys, they don't limit themselves. They keep adding to their toolbox, if you would. And they have drive, and they have discipline. And, i got to say also, two of the most polite young men you'll ever know. And they, are the, they actually are the, re, they're the kind of people you want to introduce to people who believe that martial arts creates monsters or creates these mean people. Because all honesty, that's something I grew up with. A lot of my family thought that martial arts taught people how to go out there and fight and, and actually taught people how to be violent and all these other things. It's all hogwash. Anyone who's ever competed knows that. But the Menu Boys are two of the most stand-up, hard-working, and also polite young men you'll ever meet on the planet. They've actually competed against the, the Adele Boys. Um, and they are on our show, of course. And again, they've been guests on this show. And we hope one day that they'll be back again soon. Uh, they are busy doing their thing. <laughs> the Adele Boys have not come on here yet. Maybe someday. The third person is a single person. That, of course, is Noah the Nightmare Tyndall out of the UK. I watch people from all over the world, folks. <laughs> and Noah the Nightmare Tyndall over there in the UK, one of the toughest, hardworking, dedicated, and also one of the one of the people who lives up to the night nickname, the Nightmare. I do have to say that he was going to be on the show once, and it was an utter catastrophe thanks to the old provider. We have a new system, and he will be back on here very, very, very shortly. Will be the nightmare. But Noah is, not only is he, he is a nice young man, you know, when you're not facing him in a cage or a ring. But when you're standing across from him, he's the last person you want to meet. He is tough, he's a tough young man. And if anyone has watched our shows, uh, I think that it resonates his real life persona and his wrestling persona on our show. He's, he's tough. He's trained in multiple things. Again, kickboxing, grappling, jujitsu, you name it. Um, Noah lives up to the nickname. He's a nightmare. He has two fights coming up soon, folks. I got to say, one of the people he's going to fight, I'm not going <laughs> to... Because I am me and because I know how to tell the ones who are the real deals and the phonies and the people who want to be tough guys... There's one fight particularly Noah has coming up that I personally can't wait to watch. Um, and <laughs> and I, I, I'm actually rooting for Noah uh, big time. Noah knows who I'm talking about, so there you go. The next person I'm going to talk about is also in the UK, and it's Leo the Bull Curtis. He is a Muay Thai fighter. He's also a row champion, which means he's a multiple sport champion. He, he does row, crew, if you would. He's in tremendous shape. He has a lot of heart. He has a lot of grit. He, and he also has a, does a lot to help, um, you know, doesn't take himself too seriously. But also in the same sense, he's committed to everything he does. He also is not afraid to have fun and also adapt to his family. I know the whole family. They're all fantastic humans. And Leo the Bull Curtis is a stand-up individual, a multiple-time champion in kickboxing, and we're proud of him. Of course, he's also on our show. The next one out of Atlanta, he actually just celebrated a year on our icons of the F4L, is Grayson the Super Duck Russell. Now, when I mentioned earlier, if you can beat an Adele boy, if you can beat an Adele boy, 
that's saying something. And Grayson, the Super Duck Russell, has defeated one of the, one of the toughest members of the Adele Boys, in my opinion. Um, and he's got a couple wins also outside of there. And he's an also a tremendous individual with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but also wrestling. i got to tell you about the wrestling part of it, because I've showed... Uh, some friends of mine who are shooters, if they call it, if you know what a shooter is, hopefully. Um, and as you guys know, I also did wrestling in high school and so forth. Um, Gr- Grayson Russell has one of the best takedowns of anyone in the current, you know, on the circuit and the youth uprising things. Um, <laughs> he's quicker than a hiccup, and if you blink, you'll it'll be over real quick. So a lot of respect for Grayson and Super Duck Russell, um, you know, and the resilience factor is, you know, nonetheless is something to be res- respected. Another individual who does have a win over an Adele boy is someone who has not been on the show yet, and I've only mentioned once, but I'm going to mention him again, and that's Connor Stellerman, of Stallman. Connor Stallman is another Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu guy who also competes at a high level. And he is someone who is committed, dedicated, works his tail off, works all of the events, doesn't limit himself, and that is a sign of a champion. I, I have a lot of respect for him. I think he's a rising someone you got to keep an eye out for. And he is, again, you got to judge by who he's facing and who he's beating. These are people who don't hide from hard fighters, and that's how you can tell someone who's going to be taken seriously if they're going to challenge someone who's going to give them a fight. Not someone they've beaten seven times over. Not someone they've heard there's going to be a weakling. You don't learn anything from that. You don't become better for that. You only become better when you rise to take you know, the biggest person down. That's how you get that better, all honesty. You don't get better by taking out the opening card. You get, you get, op- you get, you get famous for taking out the main event. That's the best way to put it. The next person, again... Someone I've mentioned once before who we're planning on bringing on this show. I can tell you that we're in the process of uh, setting it up, and that's Isa, Isaiah the Natural Trainia. He is another young man who's tremendous in martial arts, great background, also on the circuit. I think he's competed against some of these young men, um, and I think he's someone you're going to have to keep an eye out for. Another individual... And we'll talk about more Isaiah when we have him on the show, I think, because I, th- I do believe we're close to having him on the show, and um, I look forward to introducing him to the world as well, because I think he's got a, um, a good head on his shoulders, and it sounds like he has a really great support system, which I think is also very helpful. The next person is someone who I have a lot of respect for, and I got to know this young man back in 2000 when the world shut down. He didn't let that stop him from training. He went into the garage, and he and his brothers would go into the garage and work and work and work. And that's Pedro Fontes. He's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu champion multiple times over. He is from Brazil, and he has competed here in the United States and all over the place. This young man has a tremendous work ethic. He has a tremendous... I've seen him put the work in over and over and over again. He he puts the work... During the, the lockdown... They were always working their tails off to the T. And that is something that a champion does. He doesn't let a setback stop them from training. He continued going, and that's a lot of respect for him and his brothers. Another person you have to keep an eye out for is another newcomer. It is Action Jackson Baker. Action Jackson Baker is someone who I think you got to keep an eye out for. I think he's going to be doing big things as well. He's going to be making a move, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu style, all that stuff. I think he's going to be someone you got to keep an eye out for. The next person is someone who knows the Adele's boys very well because he's trained with them, and that's Jake the Snake LeBlanc. LeBlanc. Um, i got to have got to have respect for the young man who trains with the Adele boys, right? He is just as brutal, just as trained, just as strength, I guess you'd say. He's just as committed as they are. He may be younger, I think, in size he might be smaller, but all honesty, I mean, that's, that's what a team that, that whole school has. That school seems to put out a lot of nightmarish future UFC champions, I think. And also the fact that he embraces the gimmick. The Dumb Boys do the same thing. Actually, all of these people who can 
utilize themselves and can see themselves as such and such. You know, the hammer, the the hunter, the devil, <laughs> the terror, El Nero, the pit bull, the snake. I mean, come on. These guys are all, they all know where they're headed, to the top of the UFC, all of these young men. So, that's, that's, that's Jake the Snake LeBlanc. He's a fantastic young man. you got to keep an eye out for him. I'm curious what happens and if you're allowed to compete against people in your own school because I'm not sure how it works anymore. It used to be you would train against other studios, other dojos, other whatever you call them. But I don't think they do that anymore. I think you have to actually go out there and face someone. I, am, I might say if my bit of advice to any of them... I think Jake the Snake needs to challenge one of the Adele's, probably Ty, if I'm going to guess. Um, you can get a win over one of them. That's something. And I think they're all tremendous fighters. In all honesty, if you're someone who wants to build yourself as a serious fighter, these are some names from some people who I do know love to fight and love to look for competitors and love to accept challenges. So by all means, look these people up, and I'm sure they'll have no problem accommodating you. Um, and I'm sure they'd, be, they'd love a challenge. Um, the next person is Dimitri Chenkov. Sorry, Dimitri Chenkov. Uh, he's a Russian uh, fighter who is currently in California, putting his together his own uh, workout plan. He's a tremendous conditioning. He has a lot of work ethic. He's very committed. He's tough as nails. He can compete with the best of them. Um, I think he has what it's take to be a future champion. Also has a business head for it. Um, and that's something that will go far past the, just a fighter. He has the ability to be a trainer and a, and a mentor. That is a special gift to have. And that's not something everybody has. So Dimitri, Dimitri is someone you have to keep an eye out for. Um, he is someone you should keep an eye out for. Because he's going to be doing big things. The next person, uh, well, uh, <laughs> um, let's see. The, the nightmare knows him pretty good. It's uh, Ant, the redhead of terror himself, Anthony Dem Demel Weeks. Demel Week, Anthony Demel Week just joined our icons of the F4L, and those people who have missed it, he he and uh, Noah, the Tyndall, they're both out of the UK. They train together, same school, same sponsors, same work ethic, just one's younger than the other, and one has red hair, the other one has, well, Noah's hair. Um, he lives up to the name, he's a redhead of terror. On our show, we've seen it. Anyone who watched the show on the 14th, you got to see a special cameo as he tried to attempt to help his comrade from the UK help become the BMMA champion against someone else we're going to mention. And he is going to get mentioned shortly. Actually, he's going to get mentioned next. But um, he's a tremendous young man who's going to have a lot of work ethic. He and Noah um, pretty much work together hard, and I think they're going to be doing big things. Hopefully, they don't fight each other because that'd be fun. Uh, but then again, again, I think that when you challenge someone like that, as long as you can keep your head level and you can challenge someone that you have respect for, I think that that would be the best thing to do. But if you're someone who is afraid that if you, you know, beat them or they beat you, you're going to have feelings about it, then maybe that's not a good idea. Because I know how competitive it can be, because I am that person. But I also know that I, even if I was to compete against someone in my school, because you do that in sparring anyway, right? Rolling with your teammates. I don't see why you can't do the same thing against someone in a tournament. Um, challenge the best. But that's just me. Anywho, I don't write the rules, folks. And the next person, of course, is a newcomer. Actually, both of them are newcomers. Um, Big E, Elijah Furton. You've heard our sh his name on our show now a few times on this podcast. You've also seen him on our Icons of the F4L, a newer member of the roster. He's out of Sacramento, California. Um, very much... He's probably the first uh, person who's into the whole martial art thing who's also embraced the pro wrestling thing as well, willingly and openly. Uh, so Big E, Elijah Furton, I think is going to be 
just as as scary as Brock Lesnar was. Uh, in fact, I think he beat Brock Lesnar. That's okay. <laughs> Actually, a lot of these guys have beat Brock Lesnar, so that's really nothing to write to home about. Um, and Matt Riddle, they take turns. Uh, and the last person I'm going to mention is another newcomer who I think he has a way about him. I think he's, he would be good as an announcer for the UFC. Definitely needs his own reality show. Uh, and that's Ryder Lockwood. Uh, tremendous young man. He is very, 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 very busy. But because of the fact that he has so much going on and so many different um, activities, I can't, you know, one of the things I can't say right now is that, you know, I think Ryder is tremendous at what he does. I think he's going to be tough. He's tough as nails. And he's committed. But the problem is, not the problem, but he is so... I think that he has so much going on that, I don't know, I feel like eventually something is going to fine-tune. And he's got to, once he zeroes in on one of those things, I think he's going to be a mint, a champion, any one of those things. I mean, he's always working hard on multiple things. Wrestling, um, wrestling, jiu-jitsu, and then, of course, um, he just started baseball randomly. So, you know, all the respect for Ryder. He stays busy. That's a good thing. I think sports is great and important for young people. I think it's great for multiple reasons. But, um, and I have a lot of respect for Ryder, and I think he's going to do big things um, in whatever he does. I th- I could see him honestly becoming the host of a sports talk show segment because he's got that charisma to talk in front of a camera. He loves doing it. It's very amusing, i got to tell you. Okay, so that's uh, 14 future UFC champions. Well, 14-ish. There's probably more than that concerned. There's four Adele boys, and there's two Menya boys. <laughs> uh, so there you go. All right, guys. I hope you guys... Um, again, I, I use these people as examples of people who I know I've watched do some big things lately and continuing... Not lately, but... A lot of these people I've kept an eye out on, and they're all fantastic at what they do. Measuring sticks, if you would. Um, and I think that in time, you're going to see these people get even better and better and better. And eventually, we'll become UFC champions. All right, folks. Time to get ready for segment four. Ants. <laughs> Tell me that doesn't make your blood go. All right? That's exciting. All right, folks. Are we ready for this? All right. So, I just talked about who the measuring sticks of the UFC are. Who the future of UFC champions are going to be. But now I'm going to show you how versatile I am. Pro wrestling. Done that. Awesome. Martial arts. Did that. Awesome. Multiple sports. Excellent. But... I've also done the filmmaking world, for those people who know as well. And and one of my special gifts, if you would, is being able to notice talent from a mile away. And to be able to recommend people at whim, when I'm asked to do so. And let me tell you, I get asked to do so a lot lately around here. A couple things... I want to take you back to my very first film project I ever worked on. Um, I got as a intern. I worked for Romero Films, and I worked on a film called um, Millwood. And it was fantastic. It was a great learning experience. Um, I learned out of one of the best, very very talented woman, Michelle Romero, um, and the whole team over there taught me a lot about whatever and one of the things that she gave me rain on is to you know keep an eye out for casting and help out with that aspect and so I had a lot of um, 
you know, in, I guess I had a lot of, you know, say into people I thought would have that quality, who would be good for what role and so forth. And that was something that I would utilize on my first project, my first film. Um, and I want to take you back to a different time. I want to, back when you actually went to a casting call. And I got to tell you, here's a couple things. One, <laughs> um, people have asked me before, like, you know, are there tips for, you know, casting? Here's the first thing. I've never, ca I've never gone to a casting call to be an actor. Um, I've done... I've done. I've been involved and been on like um, sets as like an extra kind of thing, but I didn't audition for that. I just showed up and was a, an extra. Uh, I did that for a lot of Happy Madison productions because they were filming in my area. I did that for a few other films in the area. Just you know, why not? Um, but then that when it became time for me to become my own, you know, to make my own projects or whatever, I had to be the one. To do the casting, I didn't get cast into things. I just did a, you know, for to be an extra, you really don't need to really go out of your way to audition. You're just an extra. But when you're doing a film role or an acting role that's going to consist of lines and delivery and whatever, a couple things I look for, and I know this is going to tickle people, I'm sure. First and foremost, um, I won't hire people who are. I know this is gonna. I know it's gonna rub a lot of people the wrong way. I won't hire people who are union, because um, for one thing, I'm not union, and the project that I'm working on will also not be union. Um, and actually, due to that, even if even if the person wanted to do my project, they wouldn't be allowed to do my project. I mean, I'm not. And again, this is all a hypothetical thing. I'm just saying this as a for instance, if you would. Um, you know, that's just not something. <laughs> I have nothing against people who choose to do the SAG thing. That's their that's their call, and and I support people who want to be treated fairly. I'm all for that. I think you're right. I think you should be. I think you need to stand up for yourselves. I think that's a fantastic thing. But I also think that from a filmmaker's point of view, from an independent filmmaker's point of view it's a lot of things that you have to take an account for when it comes to budgeting a independent project an independent film is not a lot of money to make a film um, you, you should have money to pay your cast or have some type of compensation for your cast at least but I do not but I mean as far as SAG goes you also have to pay for all kinds of other things when you're a filmmaker so on a principle, I won't hire people who are SAG, sadly. Sorry. Not, not right now, anyway. Well, of course, no one's going to hire anybody right now because no one's working right now. But I'm just saying, for an instance. But, let's say for hypothetical, I was to hire some people who are SAG. That's what we're going to go with, right? My first project, I didn't hire anybody who was SAG. I had people who... All honesty, here's a couple things that I look for with people. One, punctuality. That's a big thing for me. Um, I myself tend to be very punctual, sometimes overly punctual. Um, this is where conflict with me and my former business partners would run into problems because they were not as on point that I was. But anyway... One thing for casting calls is I look for people who are punctual, people who are reliable, and people who are confident, and people who bring that something extra. Anyone can read lines off a piece of paper. I'm not really interested in what you, how you read a line. I want to see how you feel a line. How do you, how do you interpret this character? How do you interpret the role? What is it about the role that intrigues you? And I got to tell you this: I there are many, many, many a times that in any of my projects, if people showed up and they had that extra, that something, and I saw something in them, I would because most of the time in those roles I wrote the film anyway, I would just write in another scene. And make sure I added them to our cast. 
That's a fact. Not a lot of people do that, folks. Not a lot of me out there in the world. But if people, my feeling was this. Someone has taken the time out of their day to come audition for my project. That, me, that meant something to me. That meant that you read the script or you read whatever is available for you to kind of get a gist of what you're auditioning for. And you wanted to be part of this project, theoretically. So that meant something to me. And all honesty, I'm all about loyalty, as I've gone on to say before. So there are many a times I would hire people and I would, you know, have castings and people would show up and I would put them, I would invent a role for them that didn't, maybe didn't ex- exist in the original concept. And why did I do that? Because I believe in them. And because if they took the time to believe in my project, even if I felt they weren't right for that particular role they auditioned for, I would offer them a role of something else that I would write in. That's something I did, and probably only I do. And that's okay. Um, in all honesty, everyone has something special that they bring, right? The other thing I look for is the personality, the person behind the character. What are they going in here for? One of my biggest pet peeves is stage parents. Um, and I'm not talking about parents who go to the, the bring their kids to these things. That doesn't bother me. In fact, some of my favorite people in the world are parents who have, you know, some of my close friends currently are people I met on a set of some kind. Um, and again, I have no issues with, you know, parents who bring their kids to roles and stuff, but I'm not going to deal with the nightmarish things of one Kit Culkin and things of that nature. I don't need those headaches, and I will not put up with those headaches. And if that's something that has happened, it's it. Um, I don't fool around. I'm blunt. I'm honest. You know, that's how it is. But, you know, once you get through that side of it, right, once you get through that, you know, past that, and you're not, you know, your parents not, you know, Momzilla or Dadzilla, once you get past that and you get in there, one of the things I always do for in my projects, it's going to be a laid-back atmosphere. In fact, your your audition will most likely be a laid-back atmosphere. I want to know who I'm working with. Are you going to be able to relax on set? Are you someone who gets nervous? Are you someone who gets anxious? Do you have energy? Or are you someone who i got to wake up? <laughs> These are the things that I look for. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an example of some people. right? These are actors and actresses who I would work with, and I'm going to tell you why I would work with each of these people. Now, again, this is in a scenario as if I'm going to cast, you know, SAG people, and people, no, I think actually every one of these people is SAG. But, regardless, I'm going to give an example of why and what I look for and why I would have these specific characters and why these specific people involved in the project. Bear with me one second. Ants... Take care of this for me. All right, thank you, ants. You know, it's nice to have pet fellow ants that you can have, you know, do your little work for you. I actually had to get the pad... I wrote everyone's names on. Not that I need it too much. Anyway, so I compiled the list. Again, this time it's not 14, it's 16. But I'm going to tell you why, to give you a kind of an example of each and why and what and what and what not. Right? Okay, cool. And I'll even point out, you know, certain acting instances that I thought stood out. One of the first things is one of my one of my current favorite actresses out there, who I don't think gets a lot of recognition or as much as she should get, is Tony Collette. I think Tony Collette is a fantastic fantastic actress. She can do it all. If you don't believe me, I want I want you I dare you to watch the United States of Tara and tell me that woman can't act. 
The United States of Tara is an example of how talented and how gifted Tony Collette is as an actress. She is a powerhouse. In that series, she had to go from one thing to another thing to another thing to another thing multiple times. And then any other time you take her out of that role and you put her anywhere else, she is a megastar. She steals the show. She, you believe the character that she is. Of course, she's also the mother of one of my favorite movies of all time, The Sixth Sense. Um, does a great job in that role. You believe that she's a mom in that role. You can identify with her in that role. But then she's also done things like about a boy with Hugh Grant, and she can keep up with him. And then she can continue and going on and on. Now, I have to be honest with you. If, the, if you did, oh, I guess I didn't do my most overrated horror movies of all time. I'm going to wait for that next month. But, spoiler alert, Hereditary is on that list. I'm not going to tell you where. But, I wasn't overly fond of the movie Hereditary, but that doesn't mean that I don't believe that Toni Collette is a very talented actress. It's not because I didn't like her acting. I just didn't like the film. I thought it was overrated. Her herself, in anything that she does, she brings her A-game. Television, movie, doesn't matter. She's A-game. She's an A-lister, in my opinion. Tony Collette. Another person who I don't think gets as much recognition as he, as he should. And a person who has a brain, and a person who is gifted, usually is a background actor. Or a third party, or a you know one of the guys, and that's Steve Buscemi. Steve Buscemi is someone who usually he, usually in a lot of Adam Sandler movies, honestly, Steve Buscemi. But he has a wide range of things that he can do. Um, he can blend in, into into any background or any story, and have you believe it. Um, some of my favorite works of his. Um, I mean, I don't know how many people know. I don't think anyone would know that one. But I know you guys would know Armageddon. Armageddon's a great movie. Um, Armageddon is an example of how he can play that kind of smart guy, zany, you know, wise guy kind of a deal. All honesty, if you can't get Joe Pesci, who is your epitome of a gangster, I think if you want a legitimate tough guy, you go get Joe Pesci. But if you want someone who can sometimes be the creep guy, or sometimes be the gangster, sometimes be the funny guy, sometimes be the call guy, sometimes be the homeless guy, sometimes be the guy you hang up by your ankles and drop into a pool, you get Steve Buscemi. Another person, <laughs> I know you're going to say, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, you're probably going to say that I, you know it's because of my the fact that he's a friend of mine, someone who I've known for a long time, and it could be because I am loyal. But um, I think that he's honestly one of the most when it comes to acting, comedy, you know, all kinds of other things. Dane Cook, <laughs> I know, I just saw that everyone's rolling their eyes. What do you mean, Dane Cook? Listen, Dane Cook is one of the one. He is a funny dude. Um, I've known him for a long time, grew up in our area at Neck of the Woods. He can do comedy, and a lot of people are like, oh, he just sits up there and swears. No, he's got good stories. He's a good storyteller. But also, the other thing about Steve, about Dean Cook, is he's a real individual, but I know you're going to, you know, if you look at movies like, you know, Good Luck Chuck or things like that, it's the same role, right? I want you to look at a movie called American Exit. That's a fantastic film. My son and I both love American Exit. Uh, that was Dan Cook and Levi Miller. Uh, he plays a father and a, and a son, kind of a duo, where he's you know trying to reconcile, whatever. Great job by Dan, putting on a performance of a lifetime. It's a drama role, folks. Dan can act. Don't let him fool you. Or don't you fool yourself. He can't act. <laughs> but another person... Okay. Another person who I would probably I think is fantastic is Dana Carvey. Dana Carvey, I, I mean, I'm sure when I said the name, everyone knows who Dana Carvey is. Dana Carvey does probably m mostly known for his role as his role as Garth from Wayne's World, or maybe um, any one of the roles from Saturday Night Live. He and David Spade, who's another person who I think is horribly misunderstood or horribly miscasted, and I think is a fantastic person, David Spade. 
He's all, I also take David Spade's slimy and sarcastic sense of humor. That, that's something I, I get behind. Dana Carvey and, and David Spade have a podcast called Fly on the Wall. Um, they've also been on our pod, on our YouTube wrestling show. Actually, Dana Carvey and David Spade have been on our show for a long time, just different partners. <laughs> now they're tag team partners on a different team. Same. But um, Dana Carvey is so talented when it comes to voices and also the spot on comedy, but also being a real dad, be a real person in general. He's also a dad, and I guess that also plays into effect. I, I do like people who are responsible adults, uh, or in in that in that aspect, we're talking about adults. Because I should say that I kind of broken into adults and then young actors is kind of how I built this. So eight adults and then eight. Uh, sorry, yeah, eight adults and then eight r- rising stars, if you would. Um, another person who I think would be fantastic to have associated with Michael Fishman. Michael Fishman, who you guys might remember from as DJ Connor on the on the Connors. Why Michael Fishman? Well, my first thing is why not Michael Fishman, but then I would go into detail. I'll explain why Michael Fishman. His years of experience. In every aspect of a production. Acting, director, producer, lighting, engineer, carpentry, you name it, he can do it. That's the kind of person you want to have on set. Someone has that kind of experience, that's who you want to be with you on a production. Because they can do a lot. They can... Where you might not be as strong as something, you have to be able to kind of accept what your strengths and weaknesses are. But when you have, when you build your team, your production movie team, whatever you're working on, TV movie, whatever, you need to surround yourself around with the right people. Having a Michael Fishman who can do multiple things, has multiple years of experience and multiple things, is a genius move. And I'm surprised he hasn't had, he is not getting drafted left and right right now. But then again, he is a very he's an awesome guy and I'm sure he's doing big things. And by the way, we're hoping to get him back on here too. As you know, Michael Fishman was the first official guest here on the all new F4 headquarters. And of course, also after him of course is Christina Ricci. Talented actress, has been around a long time. <laughs> kind of fits the mold for everything. Can blend into everything. She's recognizable everywhere. Um, yeah, I'll just say that about Christina Ricci. A lot of experience, a lot of knowledge, recognizable, and performs very well. Um, and then you got Tyler Maine. Tyler Maine, folks. How many people know who Tyler Maine is? Well, I'm going to tell you who Tyler Maine is. Um, Tyler Maine, by the way, is a Hall of Famer for us on Jazz and Sons Dream Matches, as he is the person we recognize as Michael Myers from Rob Zombie's Halloween. But he was also Sabretooth in the X-Men. But what you might not know is Tyler Maine is also one of our wrestling boys, too. His, um, Tyler Maine wrestled for multiple years for WCW. And that's probably why I get along with him so well. And I think what's always amusing about Tyler Maine is the fact that he always reminds me of how short I really am. But one of the nicest, gentle giants you'll ever meet. One of the things that I love about Tyler Maine, yeah, he's he could be a scary dude in a lot of things. Michael Myers crushed it, all of those that he did. And then Sabretooth crushed it, right? But then he went ahead and did that... Uh, granted, I know that a lot of people didn't like the movie overall, Pant, Pants on Fire, or whatever it was called. But what a role, what a job he did. He can adapt. I honestly would hire Tyler Maine, instead of being a double or an extra or a person in a suit, I would not only bring Tyler Maine in, I'd give him a speaking role. And I, I think I could have some fun with Tyler Maine. And also, he's a genuine, awesome human being who always does things to help out charities. Always out, he uses his voice and his platform to raise awareness for all kinds of different things. And I respect people who don't get make themselves out to be so humble that they're not willing to give back to people. I love the fact that Tyler Maine 
is someone who lives the F4L way. He helps others who need to be helped, and I think that's awesome. The Gentle Giants, that is Tyler Maine. I have to do an honorable mention at number eight, because he's my favorite actor of all time. And this is the actually kind of how I look at acting. To me, a great actor, a great performer, is someone who can do multiple things very well. Now, everyone's going to have their different ideas of what an actor is and what a good actor is and what a, you know, whatever else, right? Sometimes it goes by what genre you like. If you like comedy, then you probably like a, a you know, if you like comedy, you probably like Steve Carell or um, Jim Carrey, Adam Sandler kind of a thing, right? You can't really put those guys into that category anymore, but you can try. But if you want action, you get Chuck Norris, Sylvester Stallone, Al Schwarzenegger, J you know Jason Statham, those kinds of guys, right? You wouldn't cast Jason Statham to be in a family comedy, right? That probably wouldn't work out well, just because of the power casting. This goes back to when I talk about you know how to cast certain things and whatnot. My favorite actor of all time was and is Robin Williams. Why Robin Williams? And I'm going to respond to you with the same question I asked earlier. Why not Robin Williams? First of all, Robin Williams has proven he can do comedy, he can do drama, and be successful at both. He can make you laugh, he can make you cry. He can make you cry, laugh at the same time, in the same movie for different reasons. That is an actor. He could do voices. He could do animation. He could do romance. He could do kids. He could do adults. Didn't matter. He could do stand-up. Always on. And you would never... And the biggest thing about it is you didn't even know how much pain he was in. Because that's the biggest performance of all. Robin Williams is one of the best actors, the best examples of what a good actor is. Someone who is successful in multiple genres, who can cross over to everything. Robin Williams can be a creep, like in One Hour Photo. He could be funny, as he was in Mrs. Doubtfire. He could be endearing like he was in Goodwill Hunting or Dead Poets Society. He could make you sing along with him like he did in Genie as a, in Aladdin. I mean, let's face it, in Aladdin, do people really remember every one of Aladdin's lines versus the Genies? Who has the more quotable things? Of course it's the Genie. And of course it's Robin Williams. Robin Williams not only did stand-up, not only did he did television, not only did he do film, he did Broadway, he did it all. That is an actor. So, in the epitome, Robin Williams is my favorite actor of all time. Because of all of those things that I just described. For those reasons. It, is, it was a sad day when we lost Robin Williams. But... The memories he's last, he's last and been indebted into our brains, into the pop culture, is endless, generational. So that's what I'm going to say about that. And that wrapped up the adult sections of things. Now let's talk about some of the rising stars, if you would, the ones who are going to be making a mark or are already making a mark. People you should keep an eye out for, and I'm going to tell you why you would hire these people. There is, again, eight of them. First one, you may or may not have heard of, is Wesley Holloway. Why Wesley Holloway? Who's Wesley Holloway? <laughs> Wesley Holloway is a very talented young man. Um, I once seen him do, I actually had to confirm it actually today, that I had seen him in a short film a number of years ago. It was hysterical. It was a short film, I do suggest you check it out, uh, he played, it was like a role reversal type of thing where it, this adult who is supposed to be a teenager comes home and 
this like teenage girl who's supposed to be the mom waiting up for your son comes home and gives the adult who is actually a kid in a writing act. Well, wait till your father gets home. And here came his father, who is played by Wesley Holloway, who's all of maybe 12 or 11 at this point. I don't know how old the young kid is, but what's funny is just the commitment level and just the utter... Because this is exactly how it works. This is how the role is, and that's kind of how kids vision adults are. That's how you know adults vision kids are. I think it was a very smart piece. Um, it was. I do suggest you go check it out. It's a short film. Um, you can find it on YouTube, I think. Uh, but it was really good. I do suggest you check that out. But Wesley Holloway, most recently, was um, in Terrifier Two. We did a cameo in that as in that in the most um, one of the most uh, obnoxiously awesome songs. I guess you'd say. It's obnoxious because it gets stuck in your head forever, and that's close as a clown cafe. Um, but Wesley Holloway, a lot of people might not know, has also got some, some stage presence as well, and has done a couple other things as well. <clears throat> We're trying to get Wesley Holloway to come on this podcast. We'll see if we can get him over here, and we'll ask him about some of these things and whatnot. And you know, as far as you know. He might be just starting or just kind of getting his feet west. But, you know, this kid can do big things, especially if he can. I talked about Robin Williams, who can go and do, you know, stand-up and comedy and drama. Wesley can do um, Broadway. He's done, st- he's done stage work. He's done short films. He's done a major film now. I think, you know, give him some time. Wesley Holloway might be something he might be even bigger. Uh, if you continue on. And he also has natural comedic talent. I can tell you that too. If you watch that short film, I, actually, to be honest with you guys, um, a while back, you know, one of the things, one of my roles currently in my area is people will ask me, hey, um, you know, I have this project coming up or I have, you know, this something coming up. Can you recommend anyone for this project? Because they know I can see things sometimes that people can't. Um, in multiple reasons why I see things. So let's say, for the sake of argument, Wesley Holloway was to come for an audition. Now, granted, most people, if everyone has ever been through a, a cat.